Good morning, Moraine Valley Church. It's good to be back together, worshiping as a family and in the presence of the Lord Jesus. Remember what the scripture said. We've been studying the seven churches in Revelation, and Jesus said he actually walks among his lampstands. Those are the churches. He's invisible. We don't see him. His spirit is here this morning with us. And what a joy to be able to exalt the name of Jesus and to worship together. Now we're looking at his word, Revelation chapter 2. As you're turning to that, let me remind you this. We're in the fourth of seven churches that we've been looking at. These letters were written uh, around 1,925 years ago. What we have learned is this so far. They, as a matter of fact, they're written to Asia Minor, a place long time ago, a long ways away from us. As we're studying them, they actually could have been written, written this week to seven churches in Chicago. That's how relevant we have found these letters to be. And you're going to find the same thing again today as we look at the church of Thyatira. Revelation chapter 2, verse 18 that's who this is being written to. And Thyatira is much like Chicago. It was the manufacturing center of Asia Minor. There were many trades that took place there. And believe it or not, it was a union city, a lot like Chicago. A lot, a lot of associations of workers that worked together in common trades. And they called them guilds. We call them unions, they call them guilds. And to understand this letter to Thyatira, we need to understand the guilds and how they operated. Actually, if you wanted to make a living in that uh, town, you really needed to be part of a guild because of the trades that were going on there. But each guild or each union had its own deity. It had its own pagan god, its own idol that they worshipped, and each guild had their own festivities and festivals that they held for their god and often accompanied with these festivities were sexual activity. And to be a member of one of these guilds, you had to participate in these festivities. Therefore, you can see that for a Christian in Thyatira to uh, really walk faithful with God and not compromise, they had the stress of making a living, being part of a guild, participating in these pagan, immoral practices. And this is the tension that this city was under. I wanna, before I read the passage, I want to tell you about one person that's referred to in here. They call her Jezebel. She's a teacher. What Jesus is, is talking about a teacher in that church at that time that was much like the Jezebel in the Old Testament. He was calling that teacher Jezebel. I don't think her name was Jezebel. He was just calling her Jezebel because this teacher was just like the teacher, or I'm sorry, just like Jezebel in the Old Testament, the wife of one of the kings. And what Jezebel was known for was this. She was the most evil woman mentioned in the Old Testament, married to one of the kings that influenced Israel, her husband, away from faithfulness to the Lord into idol worship with Baal. So that's what Jezebel was known for. And what Jesus is saying in this to this church is you've got a Jezebel in your church. You've got somebody who's leading people away from being faithful to Jesus into idolatry. So as I read this, keep in mind what's going on. You've got the pressure of the guilds the, coming in upon these people. You've got a teacher within the church that's teaching them and leading uh, and influencing people away from Jesus into this idolatry that was in their community. So listen now as I read, starting in chapter 2, verse 18. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira, right, the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire 
and his feet are like burnished bronze, says this. Now, let me just say this real quick. Eyes like, you know what fire does? It, it burns anything up in its way. Jesus' eyes can see through anything and everything. He sees what's going on. He sees beyond the external. He sees beyond the appearances. He sees beyond the things we try to put on. And he sees everything is burned out of the way so that we'll see later on this fact. He sees to the depths of our hearts. And his feet are like burnished bronze. You know, uh, when, when you talk about someone going into the fire in Scripture, the fire is your, used to burn away anything impure in them. And when it comes out, it comes out like the shiny, perfect metal. You come in, a piece of metal that's imperfect, you put it in the fire, the impurities come to the surface, you remove the impurities, and it comes out as a pure, shining piece of metal. Well, when it says that Jesus has feet are like burnished bronze, you know what they're saying? You know, Jesus has nothing impure to burn. <laughs> He's holy. He's like one who's already been through the fire, but there was nothing to burn. He is so pure that he is like one who came out on the other side of the fire before there even was a fire because of the holiness and the purity of Jesus. So he's starting off and laying out before these people the fact that Jesus sees thoroughly to the core of our beings what's going on, and he is fully holy, perfect, without imperfection. And this is what he says about this church. I know your deeds and your love and faith and service and perseverance and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. In other words, you're even doing more than you did at the start. You guys are serving Jesus at the start. You're even doing more and more as time goes on. But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess, and she teaches and leads my bondservants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, and she does not want to repent of her immorality. Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of her deeds. And I will kill her children with pestilence. And all the churches will know when Jesus brings upon this discipline, upon this group of idolatrous, immoral people, both the teacher and her followers, when he brings this discipline, I, I want all the churches to know when they see this that I am he who searches the mind and the hearts is the one whose eyes burn everything in the way. And guess what? He sees, well, you know, these two words include this. Not just our thoughts. He sees my motives. He sees my desires. He sees my feelings. He sees my affections. In other words, th this word, these two ideas come together. It says Jesus sees to the core of our being Everything is laid open and bare before the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Nothing is hidden. Jesus sees it all. And you know what that means today? Jesus sees everything that's going on in my heart and in my mind right now. And he sees everything going on in yours. He knows our entire life. He's the one who sees it all and searches out the core of our being. And he wants, when he disciplines this group of people who are following these ungodly ways, one of the results Jesus wants of that, he wants his churches to know, I see it all. <laughs> I see down to the core. There's nothing hidden from my sight. You might think you're in the dark. You might think what you're doing is over there. You might think I'm the only one that knows what's going on in here. Well, Jesus knows what's going on in here as well. And he wants all the churches to know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts and I'll give each one of you according to your deeds. And I'm going to pursue deeds next week a little bit further because that's what that church was all about. Let me just say this quickly. Five of the seven churches are all evaluated on their deeds. Interesting, isn't it? We're saved by faith, not by works. 
But Jesus is evaluating these churches based upon their works. Not only does he evaluate them according to their deeds, he says, I want all of you to know that I'm one who rewards people according to their deeds, and I'm one that judges and disciplines people according to their deeds. We'll talk more about that next week. But that's what Jesus wants us to know when he disciplines severely those involved in immorality and idolatry. But then he says this, but I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I place no other burden on you. Nevertheless, what you have. What do they have? In verse 19, we saw what they had. They have deeds. They have love. They have faith. They have service. They have perseverance. What you have, hold fast until I come. Now we'll read the rest of the passage when we get to that part of the sermon, but that, that's, that's the word that Jesus has to this church. They were doing a lot of things well. He commends them in verse 19. I know your deeds, your love, your faith, your service, your perseverance, and your deeds of lead are even greater than at first. But then he comes to them and says, I got something against you. I got something against this church. You're tolerating the woman Jezebel. She calls herself a prophetess. She's a teacher. And she's teaching dangerous spiritual things that are leading my bond servants astray so that they are committing acts of immorality and they're eating things sacrificed to idols. You know, they're, they're allowing this to happen. They're tolerating it. They got a teacher within the church that's teaching stuff that are leading people away from Jesus and into immorality and idolatry. And you know what? They're, they're kind of distancing themselves from it. They're tolerating it. They're letting whatever happens, I'm standing back, I'm gonna let it work its way out. It, it just, whatever happens, happens here. And somehow they got this teacher within the church that's teaching false stuff and they're not dealing with it. And Jesus says, I have this against you. And then he talks in verse 21. He says, I gave her time to repent, to come to grips with what she was doing, to acknowledge her sin, to change her way. I gave her time to repent and she does not want to repent of her immorality. Behold, and now this is the discipline that Jesus is going to bring to her and to her followers, which she, call, which she calls her children. Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of her deeds. And I will kill her children with pestilence. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches the mind and the hearts and I will give to each one of you according to to your deeds. They were tolerating this teacher, this false teacher, teaching things that were not consistent with God's word, things that were causing people to leave Jesus and to live an immoral life. And the, the discipline is severe. I'm a thrower in a bed of sickness. Great tribulation upon those who join her in her idolatry and immorality. And the followers, her, her children, pestilence, great discipline. Why is this so strong? Well, I think it's interesting because actually we learned last week with the church of Pergamum that, that there was actually a group of people within there called the Nicolaitans that held to a belief and a teaching that it was okay for them to get involved in idolatry and all the immoral practices that go with it because of the pressure of emperor worship that was upon them. And so this group said, hey, guys, there's the only way you're going to live. Otherwise, you're going to die, so it's okay to do this. Jesus said, I'd rather have you die than to give in and compromise to the pressure. But these Nicolaitans were teaching. There were a group of people, there were a pocket of people within that church that held to that kind of teaching. In this church, 
The discipline is put on steroids of what Jesus can do because he says, you know what? You don't just have a group of people in this church that hold to this. You got a teacher teaching it. See, in the last church, there were people within the church, pockets of people that believed this, this teaching, this freedom that said, hey, I can get involved in these things. In this church, they got somebody standing up Sunday morning, Tuesday morning, Monday night, fill in the blank, whenever it is. I don't know where they were, but they were teaching the people in this church in a way that led them away from Jesus and his word and led them into an immoral lifestyle. Remember what Jesus, or I'm sorry, in James, James said this, let not many of you become teachers, brethren, Knowing as such, you shall incur a stricter judgment. You know what? God has a higher standard for those who teach his word. There will be a stricter judgment. Guess what, guys? I'm one of those. (laughs) I'm here every Sunday saying, thus says the Lord. And so when I stand before God someday, there'll be a stricter judgment upon me uh, because me as a teacher and you as a teacher, whether it's a small group leader, a ministry leader throughout the week, uh, whatever kind of thing where you're teaching, teachers are held to a higher standard. And there'll be a greater judgment and discipline for teachers who are not teaching what God says. And so that's what's happening in this church. Guys doing a lot of good ministry. A lot of great things. Matter of fact, even doing more now than when you started. But you're tolerating a teacher that's bringing ungodly things and influencing my people in a negative way. Then he says this. Well, let me say, let let me make a couple uh, comparisons at this point that'll help us understand too. When we compare this to the church of Pergamum, which we looked at last week, Same thing, remember, uh, you're going into immorality and idolatry. Same thing here, I was kind of like, what's the difference? It's kind of like you're saying the same thing to both these churches. No, one, there was a group that held to it within the body. The second one had a teacher that was proclaiming it from the front. That's this church and why the judgment is so strict. Also, the church last week, the difference was that they were under the pressure of emperor worship. Remember, they were the political center of Asia Minor. They were the ones that emperor worship took place every day, not just once a week. And to be able to buy and sell in the market, you had to proclaim Caesar as God. They were under the pressure of emperor worship to compromise. This church was under the pressure of business and making a living to compromise. And some of those here that work in the business world understand what I'm talking about, some of the principles to compromise that sometimes they can be put upon you upon those who end as only to make money (laughs) or to advance whatever and forget about the things that are important to Jesus. And so there's many, I've talked to many business people who have wrestled with the stresses and the pressure sometimes that come upon them from a business sense to compromise. So th- that's what we learn as we compare this church with Pergamon. This is a very interesting comparison with the, with the church in Ephesus, the very first church we looked at. Because this is what the Ephesus church was commended for. You don't tolerate evil men, immoral living, or those who call themselves prophets and are not, but you found them to be false. You know what the Ephesus church did not tolerate? Immoral living and false teaching. You know what they were criticized for? In the midst of all that, you guys left behind your love someplace. You kept on working for me, you kept on serving, but you left the love behind. Well, this church is just the opposite. They're commended for their love, But here they're tolerating immoral living and false teaching. And what we learn as we look at the seven churches and we keep on learning more and more lessons as we look at this, Jesus cares about them all. (laughs) Jesus wants his teachings to be pure. He wants his people to be pure. 
He wants us to be loving people. And we talked about this even last week, the tension of love and truth. Jesus doesn't just want truth and forget about the love. Jesus doesn't want love, forget about the truth. Jesus doesn't want just love and truth. Jesus wants us to be people who somehow live in such a way that our love and our truth and our purity all become one. And we're people who are living in the midst of this culture that is constantly trying to squeeze us into its mold to buy into its ways and its practices to be people who can live in it, not just pounding the fist of truth, not just bending to the, the uh, importance of love, but people who can walk together, live pure, and walk in love and truth and grace and truth all as one. This is Jesus' heart for his church. This is what we want to be, continue to strive to be, as a people that are pleasing to Jesus. And we're seeing this more and more as we walk through these churches. And then he finishes with this reward. Verse 26. I didn't read this before, but it has to do with reigning in the future. Look at what Jesus says. Remember, he told them, uh, nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. He calls for repentance of those who are involved in the sin. Those who are walking well, hold on to your faith, hold on to your work for the Lord, hold on to your love, hold on to your service, hold on, keep on doing that until I come. And then he says in verse 26, he who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end, listen to what Jesus says, to him I will give authority over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces as I also have received authority from my father and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Guys, this, this I, I still can't wrap my mind around it. Actually, we see this in the context of giving and the use of the gifts and the talents and the money that God has given to us, Jesus says part of the reward of being faithful in the use of these things will be the authority that you're given in the future kingdom to reign with him. This is talking about the same thing. It's talking about those who are faithful to Jesus and walking with him in these ways, that the same way that Jesus has received from the Father the authority to rule Jesus is going to give to us the authority to rule over the nations. Guys, this, this is the motivation here. <laughs> Guys, this is why you want to pure, because there's a life that's coming that the way you live now determines what that future life is going to be like. That future life, in comparison to the life we're living now, is kind of like living... 50 billion years against one heartbeat. Our current life is the one heartbeat, guys. And we're making choices in this one heartbeat. We called it the two-second life before, the one breath. That we're making choices that are going to impact this life that's going to go on forever and ever. And, and, and so right now he's talking about our reign with him. We see in... Um, the last chapter of the book of Revelation in the new heaven and new earth that we're going to reign with him forever and ever. But we also see something in the 20th chapter where there's a kingdom that's going to last a thousand years. They call that the millennium where we're going to reign with Jesus. And he's referring to that right here. Because the reign he's talking about here is a stern reign, right? Right? going to break those nations to pieces. And we're going to be reigning with Jesus over the nations. And during the millennial kingdom, there's going to, and the rule of the day will be righteousness, but there still will be sin and death. Guys, kind of like today, the rule of the day is becoming more and more evil. <laughs> and there's a little bit of righteousness. Well, guess what? There's going to be in that time of the kingdom, the rule of the day is going to be righteousness but there's still going to be some evil and death during that millennial kingdom. 
in the eternal kingdom. No one, you read Revelation 21 and 22, nobody that's evil, nobody that's immoral, nobody that's idolatrous, nobody that's unbelieving is going to be a part of that kingdom, that eternal new heaven and new earth. So when he says that you're going to rule over the nations with a rod of iron and break them like like a potter's vessel is broken, he can only refer to that 1,000-year kingdom because it can't be eternity because in eternity there'll be, no re- there'll be no need to rule with a rod of iron. There'll be nobody evil there. There'll be nobody that needs to be broken. There'll be nobody that needs to be brought into submission. So Jesus is saying during that time on earth for a 1,000 years where he's reigning from Jerusalem as king, he says, guys, if you hold on, and walk faithful to me in this two-second life, when we get into that thousand years, you're going to be reigning with the same authority the Father gave me, I'm going to give to you, and you're going to reign with me over the nations. And then the good news is that in eternity will reign forever and ever. And so that's what Jesus says to that church. And by the way, that's what Jesus says to our church today. Like I said, these things are so relevant. You say, wait a minute, Pat, idolatry? That's not relevant to us. Well, last week we talked about immorality and how that has really uh, become a part of our culture and is pressing in on the church, squeezing even the church into its mold. We think, well, wait a minute, the North American evangelical church, certainly there's no idolatry going on in there, is there? Guys, North America is full of idols. We got a deep misunderstanding of idolatry. We think of idols as statues of wood and metal that people bow down to. Matter of fact, Ezekiel, even back at that time, uh, when he was confronting the leaders, he said to them about the idols, these are idols in your hearts, guys. Idolatry starts in the heart. And the idols today that we bow down to are not statues of wood and of iron and silver. We bow down to possessions. We bow down to positions. We bow down to pleasures. We bow down to people. And we find that we are being squeezed by this world's mold and its value system to make those things take the place of God. So what's an idol? Let me try to define that so we can get a little better picture on this and we can take a look at our own hearts today. Listen to what uh, I think it is Ephesians 5, 5 says. For this you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. I want you to see this. Or covetous man who's an idol he he connects covetousness with idolatry here look at the verse in colossians as he says this therefore consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality and purity passion evil desires and greed which amounts to idolatry covetousness greed very similar to one another covetousness and greed are idolatry what does that mean while covetousness or greed is saying this, I'm not satisfied with what I've got, I want more. That's the heart of those two, isn't it? I'm not satisfied with what I have, I want more. So what's the heart of idolatry? I'm not satisfied with God and the gifts he's given me, I want more. That's idolatry. That's the heart of idolatry. I, I, well, let me tell you what a couple others say. I, I don't want to get sad because I think I, I got it in a good order here to help us not get confused. I want to tell you what some people say. Tim Keller says this. Whatever you look at and say in your heart of hearts, if I just had this, then I feel my life would have meaning. Then I know I would have value then I would feel significant and secure. If I just had this, 
And, and you know what? Just having God and the gifts he has us aren't enough. There's something more. If I just have that, then I'll be okay. Uh, John Calvin said this, idolatry is to worship the gifts in place of the giver. It's when I take the things that God has given us as gifts and as resources for our life and we put them above God and we start to love and worship them more than we do God. Pat Peglow says this. You can't, you, the names I'm going to say today are so heavy. Tim Keller, John Kelvin, Martin Luther, and Pat Peglow. I mean, it doesn't get heavier than that, does it? There's one we can cross off the list. I'll let you figure out who that is. But listen to what Pat Peglow says. An idol is something or someone else that we put in the place where God belongs. It's what we love more than we love God. It's what we're trusting in more than we're trusting God. It is what or who we build or center our life around rather than God. It is what or who we look to fulfill our deepest needs and our greatest hopes rather than God. It's what we find our significance, our identity, or our meaning in. Guys, any possession, any pleasure, any position, any person we love more, trust more, build our life around, look to meet my needs and give me what I need, guys, becomes an idol because all of that is supposed to come from God. It's something we put in the place of God. And this is what Martin Luther said about it. If you uh, note that uh, idolatry is the first of the Ten Commandments. And Martin Luther said this, the reason idolatry is the first of the Ten Commandments is because you can't break any of the other ten without first breaking idolatry. I thought that's very interesting. He says, why do we fail to love? Why do we fail to keep our promises? He says, that, this is Martin Luther. He says, a general answer said, well, we're going to weaken sinful. He says, but this is the specific answer. Because there's something you feel you must have to be happy. Something that's more important to your heart than God himself. We would not lie unless we first had made something like human approval, reputation, power over others, financial advantage, more important and valuable to our hearts than God himself. Guys, idolatry is big. Very first one of the Ten Commandments, the, the heart of God's revelation of his own heart and morality. I think Luther is right. Guys, we can't, all these other sins really come because we break the first one because there's something we're looking for more than God because I'm not satisfied with God and his gifts. I need more than that and I need that and I'm looking to that and now that pushes and crowds God out and becomes the thing that I'm building my life around and loving. That's idolatry. That happens in North America. That happens in evangelical churches. That even could happen at Moraine Valley Church. It could even happen in leaders at Moraine Valley Church. Is there anyone or anything that we want more and love more than God himself? That's become an idol. And Jesus, in Revelation 2, says, Repent. If that's where you find yourself today, or if that's where I find myself today, Jesus says, repent. Come to grips with that. Recognize so deeply that what it is is change the way you think about that thing, that no longer is this the thing you love, but rather this is an idol in my life, and change the way you live your life in light of that. That's what repentance means. Come to grips with this idol in your heart that is taking the place of God in your life and repent. Paul in 1 Corinthians 10, 14 says this, therefore my beloved flee from idolatry. New Testament believers, 
not bowing before statues and wood. Flee from idolatry. Flee from those things that you are placing above God in your life and the way you live it. Listen to what John said in 1 John 5, 21. Little children, guard yourself from idols. Be in constant watch. Guys, guard yourself. Keep an eye out. Watch over your heart. Jesus says repent if you're already caught in it. Paul says if you see anything that looks like an idol, get out of there just like Joseph did. He fleed temptation. Get out of the area if this is, could become an idol to you. And then John says, constantly be watching over your heart regarding idols. You know, as we go to communion, I want you to be thinking about this. I want you to ask God to show you, are there any idols in your heart? I'm going to read you a passage of Scripture in Isaiah 4 because you know what? We need God to show us idols. You could be sitting here up to this point and say, I'm good, I'm good. You turn to Jesus, say, Jesus, show my heart. You may fall on your face on the floor and say, wow, God, I had never realized I made that an idol. Because idolatry is something we don't have the ability to see with our own eyes. It's very deceptive. Listen to what Jesus said to Israel, or I'm sorry, God said to Israel, Isaiah 44, regarding their eyes, said, surely he cuts cedars for himself and takes a cypress or an oak and raises it for himself among the trees of the forest. He plants a fir and the rain makes it grow. Then it becomes something for a man to burn. So he takes one of these trees and he warms himself with it. He also makes a fire and bakes bread. He also makes a god and worships it. He makes it a graven image and falls down before it. This is what Isaiah says. Half of it he burns in the fire. Over this half he eats meat as he roasts the roast and is satisfied. He also warms himself and says, ah, I'm warm, I have seen the fire. But what does he do with the rest of the same piece of wood? He makes it into a god his graven image. He falls down before it and worships. He also prays to it, says, deliver me for you are my God. And then listen to what Isaiah says. They do not know, nor do they understand for he has smeared over their eyes so that they cannot see and he smeared over their hearts so that they cannot comprehend. Guess what? When you get, when you get caught up in idolatry, there's a spiritual deception that keeps our eyes from being able to see I'm caught in idolatry, that keeps our hearts from understanding that I'm caught in idolatry. He says, no one recalls, there's no knowledge or understanding to say I burned half of it in the fire and baked bread over its coals and I roasted meat on it. Then I make the rest of it into an abomination and I fall down before a block of wood or if it's a person before a piece of flesh, or if it's a possession before a thing, or if it's a position before some kind of status, or if it's a pleasure, just some kind of thing that satisfies my flesh. We, we fall down before it. This is what he says. He feeds on ashes. Guys, these things are empty. They don't satisfy. They don't do what only God can do. A deceived heart has turned him aside and he cannot deliver himself nor say, is there not a lie in my right hand? Guys, when it comes to idolatry, we can't even see it in our lives. We don't understand it because it works such a spiritual deception in us that we're blinded to it. And we don't realize that this thing we based all our hopes on cannot provide what we're hoping for. And once we even see it, we can't even deliver ourselves. Only Jesus can. So as we go to communion this morning, this is the question I'm asking myself and asking you. I, I tell you, first of all, ask 
Ask Jesus to search out your heart. Say, Lord, turn on the lights. Is there something I've put in your place? That's the first thing we have to do. Then we need to, is there something I need to repent of, Jesus? Is there something you show me that I'm already caught in? Is there something I need to flee from because it's getting, I'm getting so close to it I need to leave the area so that that idol doesn't take control of me? Or Lord, is there, something, is there something I just need to guard against day by day, moment by moment? I'll give you a few minutes to pray. In a few minutes, the ushers will pass out the communion when Josh tells them. But I just want you to take a few minutes just to spend before the Lord, as I will as well, asking those same questions.